invite a warm welcome to all our participants. Uh, we're excited that so many of you are joining us uh, from all over the world, in fact. Yes, and, and good morning from my side as well. So um, I think we should get started and uh, let's look at the PDF analysis in the home laboratory. Maybe just in case you want to get in touch with us afterwards, um, you can get in touch through your local sales representative, but also please feel free to contact us directly um, via email. So this is our plan for today. We'll um, start with an uh, introduction on the pair distribution technique, but we will be assuming a little bit of basic background on XRD already. So um, we hope that uh, this is true. Most of you actually signed uh, that they have experience with powder diffraction, so it shouldn't be too complicated. And after our introduction, we will take a look at different instrument configurations and how they can be used. We will be using three case studies for that. And at the end, we'll wrap up and we'll have uh, time for questions and answers. Most of you will be familiar with X-ray diffraction, and you probably have access to a diffractometer to measure samples as well. This could be a classic Bragg-Brentano instrument for face identification and quantification, or it could be a multi-purpose diffractometer, maybe with non-ambient capabilities, or even a single crystal machine shared between several research groups. For each of these three cases, we will show you how to adapt the instrument to do PDF analysis at home. Now, why do I need PDF? Well, extracting structural information from XD data relies on the information contained in the Bragg peaks. Ideally, we like these peaks to be narrow and well separated so that the intensities of the individual reflections can be determined easily. However, if the structure has defects or even no long range order at all, these sharp Bragg reflections will broaden and the diffuse scattering increases. All this makes the analysis of the Bragg peaks more difficult and maybe even impossible. By contrast, the pair distribution function analysis, short PDF analysis, makes use of all the scattering both the Bragg and diffuse, and it does not depend on the presence of sharp peaks. Another important difference is that XRD gives the average structure information, whereas PDF provides insights into the local to intermediate structure. Now, why is this difference between the average and the local environment relevant? Well, let's take a look at the ship here. If the navigator of the ship only relies on the average depth of a waterway, the ship may well run aground on a rocky outcrop, even if, on average, the water depth is much greater than the draft of the ship. Likewise, in structure analysis, uh, relying on the average structure only can be misleading when you try to understand the physical properties of a material. classic example illustrating this difference between the average and the local structure is the silicon oxygen bond length across the alpha to beta phase transition in quartz, which is shown here on this slide. The plot on the left shows uh, with the black squares the silicon oxygen bond lengths determined by Rietveld analysis. And you see that they drop at the phase transition around 846 Kelvin, so a shortening of the silicon oxygen bonds at the phase transition on heating. That doesn't really make much sense. But if we look at the total scattering or PDF analysis, we see a different picture. That's the empty circles in the plot on the left. You see that there is no dramatic change in the silicon oxygen bond length. And the reason for this difference in the um, evaluated bond length is illustrated on the right in the cartoon. 
The Rietveld analysis determines the silicon oxygen bond lengths indirectly from the distance between the average position of the atoms. So for the oxygen, that's given by the green circle. But the average position of the oxygen, as determined by XAD, is in the center of that circle. PDF, on the other hand, gives the instantaneous atom pair distance and thus direct information on the local structure. So you see the difference in the apparent bond length in black, which is quite short, and the actual bond length in red that we can access, access with PDF. As we've just seen on the example of quartz, pair distribution function analysis can provide useful insights when the classic diffraction analysis falls short. The applications of the PDF method range from crystalline materials, where unexpected properties force you to look more closely at the structure, all the way down to amorphous materials that show low or broad diffraction peaks and make Bragg analysis impossible. Now, before I hand over to Michael, who will explain the PDF function in a little more detail, we would like to hear from you what your experience level with PDF is. So for this, we will have a short poll. And please take a few moments to answer your, uh, the question. It should appear now, uh, probably on the right hand side of your screen near the Q&A panel. Um, please select an answer and click the submit button to um, register your answer. And we will continue uh, talking in the meanwhile. Michael, over to you. Okay, thank you, Christina. Yeah, so as we've seen, um, we get a, a little bit of a better understanding of why you would want to use PDF. So now I'll talk a little bit about what exactly is the PDF. So let's have a closer look and what it can tell us. So the pair distribution function, or PDF, gives the interatomic distance distribution or probability of finding atom pairs at a certain distance, r, apart. Another way to think about it is like a weighted histogram of all atom-atom distances in a sample. Let's start with a really simple example, like, say, a clust cluster of coins sitting on a table. If we measure the distance between two nearest neighbor coins in units of coin radii, we see that these two coins are 2r apart. And if we sum up all the nearest neighbor coin pairs in this discrete cluster, we get a total of nine pairs. And we can continue on and looking at the next nearest neighbor. The distance is about 3.2r apart, and we have three such uh, such pairs. And finally, the largest coin pair distance in the cluster is 4r. Now, this is really a simplification of a real problem, but it helps to illustrate the power of the PDF. It is a real space function and tells us where the coins or atoms are in relation to one another. Now, of course, in a real sample, we're dealing with many more atoms. So it's more convenient, although perhaps a little less intuitive, to look at what we call a reduced PDF. Uh, the function is subtracted by the average number density of the sample, which causes it to oscillate around zero. The details aren't important, but it is important to understand how the PDF looks. Fortunately, because the PDF is a real space function, we can get some direct information just by looking at the curve. First, the peak positions tell us about the bond lengths and, and distances between atom pairs. The peak areas give information about coordination number, and it's also related to the scattering power of the atoms involved. For example, a PDF peak corresponding to two lead atoms will be much larger than, say, between two oxygen atoms. The width of a PDF peak can tell us about the di distribution of atom-atom distances. The broader the peak, the larger the distribution of distances. This could arise from dynamic disorder, like vibration of atoms along, along its lattice points, or from static disorder. And lastly, a uh, small crystallite size in the sample will lead to a dampening of the PDF. 
as a function of R. By looking at how far the PDF signal continues, we can calculate the particle or domain size. So as we can see, there's a wealth of information that can be extracted from the PDF. So I think we've had enough time for you to answer the poll question. So let's have a look and, and, and see the, the results. So Christina, do you have any, uh, any results to look at? Yes, I, I do. I think, I hope everybody can see them. And um, we can in fact see that uh, many people took part. So thank you very much for, for doing so. And the vast majority, I think about a third of you have never really um, used PDF. So we're very happy that you're here today and um, hope that you can, um, you can learn more about the technique. And also for those who've maybe heard a little bit, but not really had the, the chance to measure any data by yourself, this will be a great opportunity to see how you can realize PDF analysis in your home laboratory. So I think that's, um, that's perfect. All right. So whatever your experience is, in the next section, we will show you the different ways to adapt and to utilize your existing equipment in order to get started with PDF analysis. Let's start with a simple instrument setup and some basic requirements that need to be fulfilled to measure PDF data. Well, can I use a typical powder diffractometer for PDF, such as a Bragg-Brentano instrument? The short answer is probably no, or at least not yet. However, with a few straightforward modifications, a Bragg-Brentano instrument turns into a PDF machine. The only strict requirement for PDF is a hard energy X-ray source, such as a molybdenum or silver tube, and a capillary stage is also recommended. Apart from that, all other components are already there. The same divergence slit and solar slits that are used for reflection measurements can be used, and also the link side family of detectors, such as the SSD 162, um, they are perfectly suited to measure everything from soft energies to hard energies. So really, it doesn't actually take that much to expand the capabilities of this diffractometer um, to do PDF analysis. Let's ask uh, our application specialist, Michael, to explain some of the details and show how this setup can be used. Okay, well, I'd be glad to do that. So uh, let's have a look at an example of an amorphous material like glass. So what I'd like to do now is uh, briefly run through uh, from measurement to, to PDF and, and how we can use um, PDF analysis for an example like this. So glass and other amorphous materials are interesting for PDF analysis for obvious reasons. There's no long range ordering of atoms and the diffraction patterns only show broad scattering features, which makes it difficult to do any structural analysis. So let's consider two glass materials, borosilicate glass and a phosphate glass. From the diffraction patterns, we can see that the two materials are different, but can we in fact extract any useful structural information? So before we do that, let's take a, a step back and, and see why uh, we need to change the wavelength of the instrument to uh, a harder radiation. So experimentally, the measured reciprocal space powder diffraction pattern is transformed to a real space PDF via an inverse Fourier transform. This has two important consequences. The extent of the diffraction pattern in Q space influences the resolution of the PDF pattern and the Fourier transform itself can introduce artifacts to the PDF. For the copper source, diffraction data can only be collected to a Qmax of around eight inverse angstroms. Here at the bottom right, we can see a calculated PDF curve of, of silicon that can be obtained with a instrument with a copper source. If we calculate the curve again, this time with a Qmax of 17, we can see two effects peaks become sharper and better resolved, and the termination effects become smaller. The difference between Qmax of 17 and 20, what you would 
get with a silver source is much smaller, which is why we say for PDF analysis, either a molybdenum or silver source is suitable, while unfortunately copper is not. So apart from collecting data to a sufficiently high Q, there are other factors to consider when planning an experiment. Background scattering should be removed so that the detector collects only scattering from the sample. If the sample is in a capillary, this is typically done by measuring an empty capillary. Additionally, counting statistics will generally get worse as a function of Q, and these poor statistics can get magnified during the data normalization. So to mitigate this problem, a variable counting stri time strategy can be employed. Simply put, the measurement is broken up into subranges, where the measurement time per step is increased for each subrange. The data becomes normalized to counts per second, and this results in a higher quality PDF because the improved counting statistics at high Q and a more efficient use of our measurement time. So once the raw data has been collected, the next step is to obtain the PDF from the raw data. The first step is a data reduction where the goal is to extract solely the coherent scattering, which contains the structural information. In the resulting reduced structure function, f of q, the high q region gets emphasized and the diffuse scattering features become very apparent. Now it becomes clear why a variable counting time strategy is so important. And then the final step is the inverse Fourier transform, which gives us the final PDF. So one of the big advantages of the PDF is that because the function is displayed in real space, we can get some direct information just by looking at it. In the borosilicate glass example, the signal is dominated by the main component, the silica. We can expect that locally, the structure would be composed of silicon oxygen tetrahedra. And we can identify the first three peaks in the PDF. Additionally, the signal more or less disappears by around 10 angstroms, where the structural coherency vanishes. This is quite typical in amorphous materials. If we look a little more closely, we can obtain bond lengths and indirectly bond angles by fitting the PDF peaks. We see that the oxygen silicon oxygen bond angle is about 109 degrees, which confirms the tetrahedral environment of oxygen around silicon. By interpreting the peak at 3.1 angstroms as silicon silicon pairs, we can calculate a silicon oxygen silicon angle of about 149 degrees, which is slightly larger than when what is seen in quartz. So this relatively simple configuration is not just limited to evaluating amorphous materials, but it can also be used for any sample type, like crystalline materials. So the raw data and the PDF data can both be modeled using diffract.topaz to obtain a wealth of information about the sample, like the average and local structures, lattice parameters, bond distances, and so on. So I think we're ready for the next example. So back to you, Christina. Yeah, Michael, thank you for these explanations and walking us through the steps that are required in, in terms of data collection. Um, I have to say, I'm always still, I'm always still impressed with the data from this pretty simple setups. And the measurements might take a little bit of time, but with the variable counting time strategy, it's actually pretty manageable. So thank you very much. So let's move on and let's take a look at a multi-purpose um, hard energy x-ray, uh, hard energy um, system. And let's see how PDF can work here. Well, apart from doing face identification and quantification, many of you will also use the diffractometer for structure refinement or structure solution work. In this case, the Debye-Shara geometry is often favored. And that means that a capillary stage is already present on the diffractometer. Again, like in the previous example, 
for PDF work, we need only a source of high energy X-rays. In this case, we pick molybdenum. But let's take a moment to optimize this configuration a little bit more. For example, a focusing mirror will deliver higher resolution data and combined with a large detector such as the IGA2R500K, this solution will drastically speed up the PDF experiment. Michael, you are a fan of high energy setups. What makes this harder radiation so useful? Well, I see that my reputation has preceded me. Uh, yes, I am a big fan of these um, of these setups. And the reason is because you, we, with these components, you can really expand the capabilities of the instrument. Uh, on one hand, it delivers high quality data, which is required for doing um, structure solution and structure refinement, in particular for inorganic materials. And the large Iger 2 detector is perfect for in situ experiments, like observing reactions in battery cells. So let's have a look at another example. Uh, measured with a setup just like this. So this is a, an example of lithium manganese oxide, um, which is a cathode material for lithium ion batteries and is also a, a candidate for frustrated magnetic materials. So at room temperature, uh, Riedfeld analysis shows that the structure can be described as a cubic spinel structure with one manganese site and an average valence for manganese of 3.5 plus. Interestingly, the physical properties at room temperature, like the electrical resistivity, don't agree with this average valence picture, but more closely resemble a situation where the manganese 3 plus and 4 plus are ordered, like in a low temperature structure. Why is that? Well, this is a situation where looking at the PDF can provide a more complete picture. With the diffract.topaz software package, we can model both the average structure and the local structure and see how these two pieces can fit together. Using the orthorhombic structure to model the PDF between 1 and 12 angstroms, the local structure range, provides a much better fit than the cubic structure. If we look at a different range in the PDF, now between 12 and 30 angstroms, which is more of an intermediate structural range, the fits using the two models are quite similar. So it appears that the manganese 3 plus and 4 plus ions do tend to order themselves locally, but these ordered domains are rather small, say less than a few nanometers. As we examine atom atom correlations further than a few nanometers apart, the structure looks more like the cubic average structure. Okay, so I think we can look at one last example, Christina. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for um this cathode material, I think it's, for me, this is such a perfect example because you can really see how with PDF, you can analyze the local structure, but uniquely, you can also get information about the different length scales. And I think no other technique has that capability of bridging all these different length scales in structure analysis. Well, so much to powder diffractometers. So shall we take a look at what we can do with a single crystal instrument? Absolutely. Well, many um, single crystal instruments have not just one, but two sources. And one of them is already molybdenum. So everything you need to do PDF is already there. Of course, it's always possible to improve a setup a little bit more. So upgrading to the latest single crystal detector, Photon 3, gives you a boost in measurement times for PDF. And it's a detector that combines photon counting and integration mode, which is great for picking up weaker signal and a good background. So I'm quite curious to see what we can do with this setup for PDF. Michael, do you have some examples? Well, luckily I do. I do have one example. So, um, well, typically a single crystal diffractometer is not an ideal configuration for measuring powders. It's really optimized for measuring very tiny crystals. The beam focuses on a sample, which results in a poor angular resolution that can be achieved on a dedicated powder instrument. But the advantage here is that with a large 2D detector placed close to the sample, the whole diffraction pattern for PDF analysis can be measured in two frames, which results in the fastest measurement times. 
So in this example, uh, this was collected in, in five minutes. So this last example, uh, we are looking at zirconia nanoparticles. Um, and zirconia is an interesting material that exists as three different polymorphs at ambient pressure. And each of these polymorphs differs in its catalytic, catalytic activity. Being able to accurately describe the structure then is important. So with small nanoparticles, the Bragg peaks become very broad. And even identifying the correct polymorph can be difficult. But if you've been paying attention to the last 30 or so slides, you have a good idea of what I'm about to say. Looking at the PDF can help us investigate the structure in greater detail. So comparing the fit to the PDF using both the cubic and tetragonal zirconia structures, we can see that while the cubic model does indeed give a decent fit, the tetragonal model fits significantly better. Additionally, looking at the structural parameters, like, for example, the atomic displacement parameter of oxygen. Um, here, it's around 5.6 in the cubic model, can give us an indication of disorder or perhaps just an incomplete model. So I think that's the end for this, uh, this example, Christina. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for sharing all these um, examples from the different lab instruments. I think it's uh, pretty pretty nice to see what we can do even with the different instruments and different setups, make make uh, use of what we already have and improve on it. So maybe if I can can summarize um, just what we've seen today is first of all is that you can get started really very easily um, using PDF technique in your lab. And that is just by switching your existing tube, which is most likely going to be a copper tube, to a molybdenum or maybe even a silver um, source. And then you have a setup that allows you to measure PDF data overnight. Of course, if you um, want to do it a little bit faster, maybe you're also involved in structural work and in situ analysis, let's say battery materials or any other material really, you might want to increase the performance and by using dedicated optics such as focusing mirrors and large two-dimensional detectors, you can really um, decrease the measurement time, improve your statistics and get PDF data in tens of minutes to a few hours. Now, if you have a single crystal instrument at, um, at hand, feel free to use that as well. It will give you great PDF data on nanomaterials. As we've seen, measurement times are tremendously short. Um, and I think it's really nice to uh, use the different um, instruments and improve on their capabilities, expand the capabilities. And with that, um, we thank you all very much for your attention. And um, uh, we would like to start the Q&A session now. We have another poll question for you. We would like to know how you would, how useful you rate the PDF analysis for your work. You'll see this um, question coming up on the screen now. Please feel free to submit at any time convenient. And we will now take a look at the Q&A and um, try to answer as many questions as as we can. Okay, so I have here uh, a few questions, Christina. Let's let's have a quick look. Um, let me get into my question and answer mode. Okay, so um, we have a question. Will the web, oh, well, you can do that one later. Uh, if you upgrade your X-ray tube on most instruments, is the radiation shielding still sufficient? Yes, Christina, absolutely. You want to handle that one? Yes, absolutely. There's, uh, you can you can upgrade your uh, tube, and if you have a Broca diffractometer, it is um, perfectly suited for hard radiation. So there's no no danger at all. So the next question here is. 
can I do analysis with a D2 phaser? Well, in principle, if your D2 phaser has a molybdenum source, you can do um, PDF in reflection. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you can do PDF in reflection on highly absorbing samples in any case. So that's a different way of measuring the data compared to, to capillaries. Yes, that's correct. So uh, this is also possible with, so the, the sample needs to meet two requirements. Um, the sample should be quite absorbing enough that uh, you don't penetrate the sample too much, that, and you need to have quite a lot of sample so that you are certain that you're only measuring uh, the sample powder and not, let's say, uh, getting signal from the sample holder, because that, that, will, uh, that will influence the results. So if you have a situation with, you have a lot of powder and it's, it's quite, uh, quite absorbing, like an inorganic powder, then this works quite well. Yeah, we have another question that goes a little bit in the same direction on what you already touched on, Michael, and that is asking about the um, background correction for the PDF uh, analysis. Maybe you can expand a little bit more on how we measure the background and what that background is. Is it the empty instrument? Is it sample holder? How does, it, how does that work? So the, the background, yeah, the background is simply uh, all of the scattering that's not coming from the sample itself. So uh, typically this is the, um, the sample container. So when you prepare a sample in a capillary, uh, you will also get signal from the capillary material itself. So typically for measuring the background, uh, we just measure the same, um, the same size capillary, it doesn't have to be the same exact one, but the same size capillary uh, with the same measurement conditions as a, as a background. So that's typically sufficient for, um, for measuring a background. Yeah, okay, thank you. There's um, also another question, um, again, on the um, X-ray source. Is it possible to do um, PDF if my XD source is copper, 1.54 angstroms? Well, uh, unfortunately, it's not. Well, you can certainly do the measurements, but the analysis may not, uh, or, or the result may not be um, uh, sufficient enough. Uh, we can go back quickly to the slides um, that illustrates this. So, um, so here we try to illustrate why this is not possible or it's not not a good idea to do this with copper. So essentially uh, a, a PDF coming from copper will have uh, both broad, very broad peaks and some additional um, artifacts that make it difficult to do a proper analysis of the uh, of the PDF pattern. So the short answer is no, it's not really suitable for that. Crystallites. So how to determine crystallite size by PDF? Uh, well, that's actually um, rather straightforward. So if we go to the last example, which is a, uh, a nanomaterial, so the zirconia nanoparticles. So we can do this uh, two ways. So first, just by looking at the PDF signal, oops, uh, just by looking at the PDF signal, we can see that the, the, the signal goes to zero around 3.54 nanometers or so. So this gives us some a, a direct indication about the crystallite size. Um, or uh, this is something you can also model. And this was done here in this case uh, by, by modeling the, the damping of the PDF signal. Uh, the crystallite diameter uh, can be uh, can be modeled and calculated as well. Okay, I think that's um, that's quite quite nice that you can see directly the influence of the of the crystallite size in in the PDF. Okay, there's many more questions. Let me let me pick another one. 
Uh, we have more questions on PDF from a copper source. I think you've answered that, Michael. Um, thank you very much. Um, now, there's a question also on um, why would you use a Goebbels mirror? Uh, is it recommended to use a Goebbels mirror to enhance the intensity if you have a multifunctional user system? So an XRD equipment that's used by many different users, would you recommend a Goebbels mirror? Well, yes, I would actually. So a Goebbels mirror will uh, will take your diverging X-ray beam and make it either parallel or, or focusing, depending on the type of mirror. Um, the advantage here is that you are uh, putting a, a, a higher flux onto a smaller area. So for example, with a, a capillary or a small, a small capillary or a small sample, you have a greater flux hitting that small sample. Uh, additionally, this will also improve the, uh, the angular resolution of the measurement. So uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, several advantages to to using a mirror for for these analysis and and for let's say general structural analysis as well. Okay, great. So um, I think we have a couple also of of you asking if it's possible to to upgrade um, your instrument. And yes, it's absolutely possible to upgrade your instrument. The exact um, opportunities will depend on your existing configuration. Um, but for example, if you have a A25 Broker D8 Advance or a Discover, um, and you are currently working with a Link Side Detector, and you're considering to maybe upgrade to to the IGA Detector, also to benefit in your in situ work or generally get down your measurement times, um, as well as the PDF, the benefits for PDF. Um, we currently have um, an, an upgrade program for detectors going on, so please get in touch with your local sales representative who will be able to advise you on what is the best configuration for your um, analytical uh, requirements. We also had a question, Michael, on the single crystal diffractometer. Uh -huh. um, and one of the questions was how the sample is loaded. So how do you prepare the sample when you want to measure it on a single crystal machine? And how did you measure the background there? Uh, yeah, so actually um, the way we did it for this example was simply to take the, the capillary as is. Um, so the same goniometer head that's used on, on the powder instrument and mount it on the, uh, the stage for the single crystal instrument. Um, now, you might have to make the, the capillary shorter because maybe there isn't the same amount of room. Um, and also to orient the, the capillary uh, so that it's, it's perpendicular to uh, the beam. So it's a little bit different from a single crystal experiment. Um, and then the background measurement was done exactly the same way. So just a, an empty capillary um, measured with the same exact uh, measurement strategy. So do you also measure the entire empty instrument, just the air, so to say? Uh, this is also possible. Uh, I think some uh, some people will do this. Uh, this is it can be important if you have, for example, a, a highly absorbing sample, um, because then it helps to calculate the uh, absorption of both the material and the absorption of the capillary itself, the capillary material. Mm -hmm. um, in general, uh, let's say it, it, it's not something I will do. Um, usually you, you can for, you can skip that step and, and save yourself some time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's nice. Okay, it's uh, a, a ton of questions. So there's <laughs> also um, a range of questions that ask a bit about the um, about the data analysis in Topaz. So some are asking, if I have data from a single crystal machine, can I use Topaz to analyze the data? Um, and um, there's another one. Yeah, can you maybe, um, and are the tutorials available, how to do PDF analysis in Topaz? 
how do we how do we analyze the data? So um, I know you've done a lot more modeling than I have. My understanding is that you can basically uh, use the same um, structural models that you or start with the same structural models that you would do in your retrial analysis. So I think there's a lot of parallels there to normal structure analysis. Yes, there are. It, it's very, very similar. So if you've if you've done Rietveld analysis on uh, on Bragg data, uh, it's actually very, very similar to do the same. Um, it's 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 a it's a small box model. So you have you you start with a crystal structure and use that as your model to for the PDF. Um, there are some uh, some differences like the uh, how the peak widths are are influenced. Um, so what we also have is since a couple of weeks, we have been doing um, regular office hours. Uh, so on Wednesdays, uh, we'll have different topics where myself or one of my colleagues will do a um, like a, a one hour session talking about a specific topic. Um, so eventually we will do uh, something with PDF analysis, uh, especially with Topaz. Um, so keep an eye on that. Uh, this is you can you can find the different sessions on the the web page. Uh, this will probably won't be a few, a few weeks. This is more of an advanced topic, um, but this is something that is well something we want to do and something we will schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think also in the direction more of what kind of samples we can analyze. Um, there are some questions about liquid samples and maybe even nanoparticles in liquids. Can we analyze them with PDF? How do we treat the the fact that we have maybe solvent present? Is there is there something we can do, or do we really need to look to to other techniques for this kind of samples? Um, it's it's possible. It's certainly tricky, um, but it's the same principle applies. So uh, if you have, let's say, particles in solution. Um, then you would also want to measure the the part of let's say the solution it's alone as as a background um, another way to do it is to is to actually measure the PDF of the solution or to calculate the PDF of the solution and the PDF of the particles in solution and then try to subtract those two curves from one another to see if there's a, a difference um, it's it's challenging for sure, um, but it's uh, it's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I think I remember you showed some some quite interesting examples of of having done that on the D8 advance. So that was pretty encouraging. Okay, maybe we take a couple more questions and then um, we will be um, slowly coming to the the end of the Q and A session. Um, some of you have been asking if we will make a recording available and yes we will make the slides and the recording available so you can go through again in your own time uh, maybe take some notes and um, listen listen to the different different explanations also on why copper is really not suitable and you do need at least a molybdenum or a silver tube now um, there's one more question which I think is actually quite interesting also because of the difference between the powder instrument and the single crystal instrument. And that is asking if you are collecting um, PDF data with a 2D detector like the Eiger, would you work with a line focus or would you work with a point focus? Or could you do either? You could do either. Um, yes, and that's that's the flexibility of, of a system like that and in a detector like like the Eiger uh, that can be used both as a 1D and a 2D detector. Um, if I had the choice, uh, I would generally uh, choose to operate the detector as a 1D detector. And the reason for this is, is rather simple. It's essentially because you have, if you have a line shaped X-ray beam hitting your sample, you have a lot more Let's say you have a lot more x-rays hitting your sample and you have a lot more of your sample being illuminated by x-rays so essentially the intensity is a lot greater um, rather than using uh, let's say a point source uh, hitting a very small portion of your sample uh, then your intensity will be lower 
So given the choice between the two, I would tend to opt for the solution with, uh, let's say, a line-shaped X-ray beam and measuring in, in 1, 1D. Mm. However, if you have a, a micro-focus source, such as the IMUS, then I think you would obviously measure a two-dimensional picture. Correct. And there you have a really high intensity, really focused uh, X-ray beam and uh, tremendous intensities coming from that source. Right. You have a very brilliant source and you have a very large 2D detector. Yeah. So then uh, even though you're only hitting a very small portion of the sample, you still have a lot of intensity. Yeah. So maybe the last question, um, or what, one of the last questions we can ask uh, is, um, is a question on, can I use PDF also for organic materials? How big should the sample be? Um, what kind of information can I get from uh, organic material with PDF? So certainly, yes, you can measure organic materials uh, with the PDF. Um, so, for example, if you have uh, something that's amorphous, you can see um, the the local structure of an amorphous organic material, which would be essentially the um, the molecular structure. Uh, we would have liked to have shown a, an organic sample, uh, an organic example, but of course we're a little bit limited in time, so we focused only on uh, these other examples. But Certainly, yes, you can measure organic materials um, with with PDF as well. And I think the good thing is you can actually use quite a big capillary, so you get a lot of sample in the beam, you get good intensities, even if your sample is, is rather weakly, weakly absorbed. That's true, that's true, yeah. So because the organic materials are very weakly scattering, uh, but you can use a lot of material, so that, that kind of um, will help that point a bit. Mm. Okay, well, Michael, thank you for answering all these questions so patiently. Um, there are many more questions. We will try to uh, compile um, FAQ and try to get in touch with um, with you with those um, those answers that you, for your questions. Also, um, please, if you are interested in um, how you can actually upgrade your own diffractometer, please feel free to contact us directly or get in touch with your local sales representative. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be a little bit difficult for us to contact you if you've just sent us a message in the in the chat or in the Q&A. So please send us a separate email and we will follow up and, um, and contact you directly. So with that, I think um, we like to, to thank everybody very much for their attention, participation, the, the good interaction in the, in the Q&A session. Yes, yes, thank you again from from my side as well for patiently listening to our uh, our explanation. And I hope that you've taken something away from today. If you are a complete beginner or even if you're an experienced user, um, hopefully everyone has has taken something away from from today's webinar. Okay. Fantastic. Until then, um, stay stay well, and uh, we wish you a pleasant day or maybe a pleasant evening. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.